Many Christians presume that the Christian life would be much smoother if only we could recover the circumstances of a previous age. It is assumed that if we could only go back in time, everything would be fine. Of course, people forget that the Church of the New Testament had problems as well. There were external pressures from Jews and Gentiles who were hostile to the Gospel message, as well as internal strife within the Church. When we look at Paul's letters to the Corinthians, we see a church that was having problems that threatened to derail its life and ministry. No church founded by Paul had more problems than the one at Corinth, but we can thank God for these two wonderful letters as a result of their difficulties. Paul shared a lot with us, including the trumpet and the resurrection. Some Corinthians claim that there was no such thing as the resurrection of the dead, it is unknown whether the teaching came from within the church or from outside. Perhaps they believed Christ had ascended spiritually to heaven, but not physically from the grave. Whatever its origins or specifics, Paul confronts it because it strikes at the heart of the gospel. The resurrection is necessary. Paul's preaching and the Christian message would be meaningless if Christ had not been raised. Furthermore, the Corinthians' faith was futile because one cannot have living faith in a dead Savior. Our salvation is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is God's sinless Son, whose death paid for our sins and whom God vindicated by raising Him from the dead. Without it, we have no sinless Savior, no perpetually living High Priest to intercede for us, no forgiveness, and no hope of being raised from the dead ourselves. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 15-18 to 18. Paul continues stating the implications of a denial of Christ's resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, their faith is meaningless. The Corinthians were still dead in their sins, rather than alive with Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, a Savior who is dead is no Savior at all. As a result, Believers who died would be lost for all time. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 Then Paul sums things up. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Indeed, if our belief in the resurrection is limited to the grave, then we have no hope of eternal life after death, are living a lie, and should be pitied by the world. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 Despite what some Corinthians claimed, Paul maintains that Christ was raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that is, of those who have died. The use of first fruits here calls to mind Leviticus chapter 23 verses 10 to 14. The Israelites were to bring the first portion of their harvest to the priest as an offering to the Lord, according to that passage. This was done in anticipation of the full harvest, as they relied on God to provide. Thus, Christ's resurrection is a promise that believers will be raised one day. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 21 and 22 Adam disobeyed God, resulting in the spiritual and physical death of the human race. Christ, the second Adam, has made eternal life available to all through his own resurrection. But each in turn. Christ, the first fruits then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 23 to 28 God has a plan and an order to his resurrection process. Christ, the first fruits, was the first to rise. At his next arrival, all those who belong to Christ will receive resurrection bodies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 to 18 but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. After his millennial reign, he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father and abolish all his enemies, including death, bringing everything under his control. With everything else subservient to him, the Son will be subservient to the Father. The Son will have succeeded where Adam failed by fulfilling man's created kingdom destiny of ruling. He will have established a kingdom to defeat Satan's kingdom ruling for humanity on God's behalf. His earthly mission in history will be completed when he hands over the kingdom to the Father at the end of his millennial reign, ushering in eternity. And God will be everything. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29 Paul cites a practice that some in Corinth were engaged in, being baptized for the dead. Paul isn't supporting this practice. Rather, he's pointing out its absurdity if there's no resurrection. Why be baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 30 to 32. Paul discusses how the reality of the resurrection affected him personally. Because of his gospel ministry, he was regularly in mortal danger. Both Jews and Gentiles had tried to kill him. He contended with wild beasts in Ephesus, 
which may be a reference to those who opposed God's kingdom. But what's the point if the dead don't rise? If there is no resurrection, Paul says, quoting the Israelites' self-indulgent attitude in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 33 and 34 You can't make unbelievers your constant intimate companions and expect to come out unscathed. It is dangerous to warm up to heretical teachings and lifestyles. As a result, Paul tells the Corinthian believers flatly, Come to your senses and stop sinning. But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. So what will be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 35 to 44 To those who wonder, how are the dead raised and what kind of physique will they have? You fool, exclaims Paul. They forgot that what you sow does not come to life unless it dies in their attempts to mock the resurrection. What has been sown is only a seed. God gives us bodies as he pleases. In fact, there are bodies for humans, animals, planets, and stars. The human body is like a seed. It is sown in corruption and weakness, but raised in glory and power. Our bodies will be transformed in the same way that seeds are. A natural body that has died will be raised as an eternal spiritual body. So it is written, The first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam a living spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 45 to 49 Paul compares Adam to Christ discussing both the first and last Adam. Adam is the Hebrew word for man. Through the power of God, the first man made of dust became a living being. The second man who came from heaven, however, became a life-giving spirit. The natural man can only die. The spiritual man can live. We have all carried the image of the dust man. What we need is to be like the man of heaven. All human beings are in Adam from birth, but through faith in the gospel, we are in Christ and have the hope of resurrection to life. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, 
that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 